All right, Mr. Graham Wardle, what's going on, my man? Thank you for making the time. I'm excited to have uh, a conversation with you that I don't know where we're going to go, but <laughs> something tells me it's going to be a good place. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm excited to be here. It's fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So look, I, I, here's where I want to start is, wait a minute, you're an actor and you're mm -hmm. seemingly awake. Can you be a, are you allowed to be an actor nowadays and, and be in that world and that hey, industry take it easy and, on the actors and, there. and have a counter narrative perspective and worldview and ideological perspective on things like yeah. what's going on walk, walk us through if that's possible and uh i won't make this too loaded but how long have, have you been quote unquote you know awake to uh some of the the lies were being the shenanigans yeah yeah um yeah, being in the uh, entertainment world is tough because a lot of your business de depends upon the public perception of you. And so a lot of people in the entertainment industry, at least from my perspective, uh, they stay away from that stuff uh, because, you know, when you go out for an audition for an acting role, producers, directors, studio people, they'll look at your social media following and they're they're trying to market you, right? So if you if in certain areas, you know, you might not get as many people watching your stuff. Um, so it's, it's tough uh, in that industry. Uh, well, most industries, but especially in, in the entertainment industry. Um, I just made a decision for myself, man, that um, I want to sleep at night. Uh, I want to be able to tell my kids that I was in integrity with myself. And um, I've always been someone that's interested in the truth and wherever that leads. And just because I have a perspective or an opinion uh, doesn't mean it's the truth, but I, I think it's, it's, we should all be allowed to ask questions. And that's always where I've always like been drawn to is like, why can't I ask this question? What's, what's behind this door. And that to me is far more important than my job or, you know, how I'm perceived is the pursuit of truth and where that leads. And so, yeah, I've done some acting in my life. I've had fun with that. I love telling stories, making movies. Um, creating experiences for people. Uh, I'm sure you love movies. Everybody loves movies, you know, watching a good movie, you feel great. You go on an adventure and to be a part of that kind of stuff is, is really fun. Um, I love it. However, uh, as you alluded to in your question, <laughs> the industry is uh, uh, unfortunately um, not as outspoken about some of the, the recent things that have gone on, which is unfortunate, um, but everybody's on their path. And um, for me, it was just about staying in integrity with myself. And it's taken me on this new journey that's been quite interesting. Um, meeting new people like yourself and many others online. And uh, it's fun. And I feel like that's what the, the adventure of life is, is when you sort of step off into the unknown and you, you follow your heart, you, you stay in integrity with yourself and you don't know how it's going to work out that step in front of you that you're shown and it's like, okay, now take this step. Now take this step. Um, so that's the path I've been on in the last few years and it's been a good one. Yeah. You mentioned that you've always been interested in the truth and um, what a concept. Hey, like, so I don't know who to credit this quote to. I actually think Jodie Foster is for whatever reason that's coming up. I think she said, um, that success is in sleeping well at night mm. and I love that and I often talk about how you know to me if I'm not prioritizing not only the truth because there is external conditional objective truth in the world I do believe in that some people who love to get very philosophical or deeply spiritual will you know, challenge you on yeah. that there is no truth, but I do believe there is an objective truth. But I also think there's your truth. And and some people will also push back on that. And they'll say, well, no, Killer, there's no your truth. There's only the truth. And it's like, no, no, no. There's my truth in that. You know, I, I believe that to be my authenticity. And my authenticity is different from yours, different from the next person's. And for me, if I'm not optimizing or prioritizing for the truth in the external conditional world objectively, and then also not optimizing for my truth, which is my authenticity. Mm. How the fuck can I rest my head on my pillow at the end of the night and sleep well? I don't know how yeah. 
genuinely, I don't know how people do that. And I just want to say, Graham, before you yeah. go, because I'm sure you have a lot to say on that. You know how many people <laughs> come up to me and say, hey, man, I love your stuff online. I just can't. I, I can't. I can't. You know, I, I can't speak out because of my job, because of this, that and the right. other thing. And I love to healthily push back on that and say, no, 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 not only can you, but we need you to, because what kind of world do we live in? If you can't have the courage, you know, our, our ancestors had the courage to go fight on the beach of Normandy or, and leave their family while they were conscripted into the army. And, and sorry, we're heroes because we just speak the truth. Yeah, totally, man. Um, I, I wanted to pick at you a bit and ask how you optimize. You were talking about the, the um, external and the internal sort of being authenticity and optimizing those so you can, you can sleep at night. What's, what's your, your process for doing that? Because sometimes they, they might conflict, you know? Yeah, so I want to make sure I have clarity on your question because it's a good one and we should explore it. So are you saying when I – so are you saying how do I optimize my authenticity? I think that was the word you used. You said to optimize both of these and to, to basically live a full life. Um, and then there being like sort of a, uh, a personal truth, an internal truth, and then an external one. So how do you juggle that? So I think that you need to first optimize your authenticity, which is finding out and going deep within and connecting to self to find out what your authenticity is. Because mm. I think that like Dr. Gabor Mate talks about, he says that most people are prioritizing attachment over authenticity. So we will do anything to please all the people around us to get the love, care and attention and the validation we always look for just so that we could then feel validated. And we actually prioritize that over who we deeply are uh, to our core. I think you have to do that journey. And that's a spiritual mm. path. You got to connect back to self and you got to really ask yourself, who am I? I know that I yeah. am a guy that likes to think differently. I know I'm a counter culturalist. I'm a, I'm a, a bit of a black sheep, or I like to recently call it a black lion. <laughs> At least I hope, right? <laughs> nice. You're a black lion. Um, and yeah, I think you, that's optimizing for authenticity is connecting back to self, learning who you are mm -hmm. and then prioritizing it is having the courage to express into the world, uh, your out. authenticity outwards, despite who may abandon, reject, criticize, judge, or shame you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. And that takes courage. And that takes a self-love that is is sometimes not so developed in, in people. I know that that's something I had to work on because taking that step was like, like you said, you referred to Gabor Mate about sort of pleasing everybody else. Um, if you love yourself and if you are connected to yourself, then that makes that process a little bit easier because <laughs> uh, you're not so worried about the, the judgment and opinions and the rejection of others. Um, but it's not easy. Uh, I found it in my own life, having been through some sexual abuse when I was much younger, there was false beliefs and doubts and insecurities that came in that supercharged that need to people please and make sure everything else was safe around me. And this was a programming system that I adopted just for survival when I was younger, but not knowing that it was, you know, part of my operating system going into my adulthood and then having to rewire that has been a process for me, but it's been so valuable to get into that place of integrity and self-love and realize, oh, Graham, this, this part of you, this younger version of you that went through this, he's okay. It's not going to happen again. And it's those unconscious sort of, uh, or subconscious, uh, programmings or belief systems that can just kind of derail us and prevent us from being in integrity, from loving ourselves. Um, and I know I've spent, and I'm still working on it con continuously, but uh, it's that sort of fertile soil that, that what you plant and what you, where you live from that then becomes sustainable in the long term and much more fulfilling as well, because it's full and you're not seeking from the outside to replenish what can only be done from within. Um, yeah, crazy so stuff. A hundred percent. And um, you're right, it does take courage. There's a part of me that thinks, though, that we live in a time of so much ease and comfort that we think, you know, we have the perspective that that's actually a difficult thing and it takes a lot of courage. 
when in actuality, I almost feel like previous generations would kind of laugh at like, that's <laughs> what it actually, that's what we call courage nowadays is to literally just show and express who you truly are. I don't know, maybe mm. I'm open to, to some pushback there, but w what made you develop the courage? Because it's, it's so much easier to just fall in line, especially in the entertainment world. What have you experienced in terms of pushback and has it been difficult and why do you think you differ from a lot of people in the entertainment world who decide to just keep their mouth shut? Um, I think everybody's on their own journey. I think I can only, you know, it's hard for me to speak. I don't know, to be honest, that that's a short answer. I don't know. I can just speak to my own journey. What got me to that point? Um, I went through a few different things in my life where you know, in the movies where the, 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 the character is about to die and his life, you know, he kind of gets perspective on his life. He realizes the sacredness of his life and the, the, the areas that he needs to improve. Uh, uh, the things that don't matter are now seen as not mattering at all. I went through a scare like that um, where I thought I had testicular cancer. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, I have a year left to live is this the life I would want to be living? Like, is this, what, what, what would I be doing? And it was real. And I think, you know, I've seen these stories in, in movies. I've heard people talk about it and share their story. And I've been impacted by that, but I went through it myself. And by going through it, I honored the lesson. I think we can honor lessons from stories and, you know, friends and family and things that we experience that aren't necessarily happening to us so much so that we can actually get it without having to go through it. Um, I don't have to become a heroin addict to know that I don't want to do that and value my life. Um, however, I went through something where I went, okay, so if I only had a year left to live, then what would I be doing? And it put into his perspective, a lot of what I had been chasing, like I said earlier, that was trying to fill a void inside. And so it was like, okay, so I got a year left. What am I going to do? And everything just sort of fell into place internally in a very simple way. And so I didn't care, Kayla. I didn't care about what I thought I should care about anymore. And it, uh, it really was a blessing and a gift. And I don't have testicular cancer, which is great. Um, but it, it was significant of enough of a scare. It gave me the context and the perspective for, for appreciating the sacredness of my life. And so that kind of led me down this path, uh, along with uh, working with um, a coach, uh, Lynette Alinda. She's been instrumental in sort of teaching me about integrity and, and moving into these higher values. Um, this journey for me has been one of no longer abandoning myself and staying in integrity with myself. And so that had to apply to everything. And this was before, before COVID. Um, and so I went through a, a separation with my ex-wife. Um, I left the, the television show that I was on. Beautiful people, wonderful people to work with. And uh, I just followed what my heart was telling me to do, which was very difficult at the time. I was doing interviews um, before I left the show. And because the producers and, and people at studio uh, network was like, uh, you know, we want to have this sort of because people are going to be upset. Um, so we want to know from Graham, why is he leaving all these different things? And all I could say in my interview was, I'm just following my heart. Like, this is what I feel is the next step. And it was very, very difficult uh, because people are like, what does that even mean? Like, what are you doing? Like, you're wasting an opportunity. You're throwing away your career. And I, I used to say to, um, uh, I had a long conversations with some of the wonderful people in the transport industry on, on film sets that drive to and from set. These wonderful conversations, about an hour ride into, into set sometimes. And, and we were having this conversation. I just, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, like, who cares? Like, who cares how much money I've made? Who cares? How, like, you know, like, it doesn't matter if I'm not internally fulfilled and happy and, and living in alignment with how I see a higher power. Um, so I've, I've always had that in the back of my mind as being the most important thing to be internally at peace and living on that edge, riding that wave of life, um, being guided. Um, so that was my process of just sort of recognizing the significance and the importance of being true to myself, being in integrity, and then uh, going through leaving the show and, and starting my own stuff and going through that um, 
has been not easy, but I would, it's been so worth it. And I agree with you about, you know, each and every one has their own path and their own way of taking that step off into the unknown, speaking up, speaking truth, being in integrity and uh, at their own pace. And I, I do agree with you about people in the past, you know, going to war and fighting and dying for their country and for, for freedoms that we just go like, oh, it's uncomfortable to say something online and might get canceled, you know, like, um, I agree with you. It, it is the context matters and it's important. And um, when we get super, super comfortable and take things for granted, uh, that's when we get lazy. That's when we get comfortable. And, you know, those weak men make hard times. Um, so it's, uh, I think I'm excited for this next chapter of sort of civilization or consciousness on earth as people are recognizing the significance of being in integrity and standing up for truth and freedom and getting uncomfortable um having these these deep conversations and meaningful conversations we're going to build a world that is is beautiful and based upon a solid foundation and so everyone has a part it's not about you know everyone doesn't have to start a podcast you know it's it's the conversations with the people you have in your home you know at the grocery store and how you live your life, where you're coming from, um, doing that inner work, which is the hard stuff. It's much easier to buy a course or to buy a pill or buy a book, <laughs> but the hard stuff is inside um, and dealing with the things that you've pushed down. So that's my, uh, my has been my path, will be continue to be my path because there's, there's always more areas to explore, to love and to expand and then to create and give into the world. Yeah, you know, I mentioned and then you just, uh echoed it that I was saying, you know, our generations from the past would have looked at, you know, uh, calling someone who speaks out on Instagram a hero or something like that. But also even nowadays, I mean, look at the, you know, you talk to a Ukrainian man right now or, or woman, talk to a, a Russian, talk to an Israeli, talk to a Palestinian, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe it's not so much uh, looking at history as it's just look at most places in the world right now, you know, most, most people mm. in the world right now have problems that exceed, or I guess concerns that exceed, like what a luxury to even be in a position where one of your greatest concerns is, are you going to get canceled on online or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What a, what a mm -hmm. champagne problem. And I would say that going back to your cancer scare, I think one of the most powerful things that we can do, uh, and I actually often say one of the most powerful things a coach can do for a client is not do the work for them. Ultimately, the client needs to do the work. But one of the most powerful things you can do is just shift the perspective, right? Shift their perspective. Because we are often one perspective shift away from a completely and entirely different trajectory of our lives going forward when faced with some sort of difficult adversity or decision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cancer scare is something I resonate with. I actually was in Phoenix um, quite a few months ago, and I actually had to fly home earlier because I felt something, you know, on my abdomen. And I knew it wasn't a hernia, but it was just, it was weird. It was different. It was mm. like, okay, I got to get this checked out. So, um, I ultimately went to the, I flew home early because I don't fuck around with my health. I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to get this checked out. So I went back to Canada, flew home, went to the doctor and, you know, they said, I don't know how your experience went, but mine was very much like, oh yeah, you know, we should go for an ultrasound. And it's like, okay, but like, are, are you optimistic? Are you like, what, what's going on? You know, I'm drilling them with the questions. I don't know how your experience was. But I'll they tell don't, you after. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like to tell you much. Right. No. And, and they love to just, you know, because, and I understand from their perspective, they don't want to give you false hope or, or false, you know, anxiety. So then, you know, I, I tried to get in that day to the ultrasound and they were, they were all like, well, it was urgent. So I see on the, the, um, requisition form it's urgent and i'm like oh fuck i didn't need to see that mm -hmm. um but they were you know just about closed or whatever so i didn't get in that day so i had to wait till the next morning and even then you know i ended up getting there late because my uber showed up late and anyway so then i had to do it in the afternoon you know so just sitting in that 
anxiety, what a massive shift in perspective for me. And it ultimately ended up just being a cyst and, yeah. you know, it's all good. And I know that's very common, right? And I don't want to be over dramatic about it, but it really did make me similar to your story. Not that they're the same, but it really did make me sit with, huh, what if I do get mm -hmm. bad news? Mm -hmm. Like, And one of the most popular or one of the most uh, powerful rather uh, exercises that I often do with clients is if they're faced with a really difficult decision, there's a whole process I take them through, but the last phase is the rocking chair strategy. And what that is, is you fast forward to your future self, you're 90 years old, you're sitting on a rocking chair, you're sitting around a fire, it's a quiet moment, no one's around, you're very present, and you're reflecting back on your life. What would that 90 year old version of you say to you right now? about this decision. And often, not always, but often it's like, they already know. They know exactly <laughs> what that version of them, 90 years old, who's lived a life. And the reason why they know is because that future version has perspective on what's really important. And that's mm -hmm. why it can be such an effective exercise. And man, uh, faced with a cancer scare will also, or a near death experience, whatever, can also do the same thing. And I really took note of what would I change? If I got bad news, how would tomorrow be different? Mm -hmm. So what, what, what was it? What was it? Into that. What, yeah, what perspective I'll, changed for you? I'll tell you. So the, the main thing, there was quite a bit. The main thing was I need to put more attention, care, and it even invest more bandwidth into community and connection in my life, mm. in my life. That was overarching, overwhelmingly. The shift for me in perspective is that I knew right away, if I were to get bad news tomorrow, the first thing I would do is not quantity, not trying to, you know, have a bigger birthday party. Talking just like deep connections because look, I get caught up in building. I'm building, I'm, yeah. you know, there's a lot of amazing opportunities that I'm taking advantage of, but that's one thing that I, I don't even need to slow down in that. I just need to, you know, invest more into that. Mm. What about, what about like, for you? Uh, yeah. Um, the last thing I want to, you mean when you say invest more in like, uh, friendships or when you say community, what does that mean? Yeah. Good question. Uh, everything everything okay friendships okay. um even so friendships i mean if we we could call everything friendships but if i separated them into yes i don't need more friends i need deeper connections with my current mm. friends ah. but also um because uh, you know everyone's fucking busy and it's easy to just like be like oh yeah you know let's let's get together next time i'm in town it's like no 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 I'm talking, you want to know what I'm really talking about, Graham? I'm talking like calling one of my best friends in my circle who is going to be in my wedding party randomly on a Tuesday afternoon and saying, brother, I'm thinking about you. How can I support you right now? And tell me what's going on. Mm. You know, I don't do enough of that. Mm. Yeah, man. But I had a conversation like that. Relationships also yeah. like just, just connection community what i mean by that is i'm involved in some communities that i've invested in coaching wise and i'm just not i'm also not investing enough into building bonds and connections in that as well too and i would say the awake community as well like like you mm. like this mm. like like let me tell you after this interview because i'm already getting a really great vibe from our dynamic and i'm all, already intrigued by your perspective and worldview, I will, I will nurture and you can hold me to this, I will intend to nurture this connection as well too. not saying we have to be best friends. But yeah, yeah. I haven't done enough of that. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I, I'm just kind of feeling into it for myself as well, like, um, and exploring it because I agree with you. And I think we all like you said, the rocking chair, I think you called it the rocking chair method. Is that how you said it? Rocking chair strategy? Yeah, strategy. Um, I have a poem actually in my book that's it's effectively the same thing. Um, 
uh, and reflection after asking people basically that question. And um, I think at the end of the day, uh, so many or at the end of your life, so many people will often reflect back and go, you know, I wish I spent more time with those that I love, that I cared about. And like you said, it's not the bigger birthday. It's the meaningful connections. And so the question that popped into my mind when you were saying this was like, what makes it a meaningful connection? And for me, it's it's being fully authentic, fully yourself, and and having a place where you can do that with another person that sees you, that can listen to you, and that can, like you said, support you if, if you're going through something tough. Um, maybe not necessarily need to fix everything, but just to be there. Sometimes just somebody hearing you is so valuable because um, they're present with you. Their attention is there and you can feel it. And, you know, I've had that so many times where I just needed somebody to be there to be like, I got you, man. Whatever you're going through, I got you. I'm just going to sit here, but I got you. And that's been a, a fantastic gift. And I, I, I endeavor to give that gift as well to the, to the friends and the people in my life, just to be there in an open, loving, listening place. And if they ask for advice or perspective, you know, great, I can give my two cents. But uh, that sometimes can be the most difficult thing is to be there with someone you care about, you love, who you've been friends with for a long time. And just allow them to go through what they're going through, the struggle, the pain, the anger. Um, I hung out with a friend once who was going through a, a split with his lady at the time. And he had a lot of pent up anger. And uh, we just went out to a river and uh, he just started to yell, just yell, just get it out. And I, I was just there to be there with him, man. So he didn't do anything crazy um, because it was a lot of emotion and he, he was bottling it up. And uh, to me, that to me is a meaningful connection as a, as a friend to be there um, for whatever you're going through uh, so that it can foster that sort of deep, meaningful thing that grows and is really, I, I call it like your golden ticket, like the thing that you get to take with you, you know, the, the lives that we touch and the sort of impact in the internal world. That's what I'm here for. Like, Yes, you need money. Yes, it's great to grow these things and have these resources to build things to impact more people. I love that. But at the end of the day, I get to take with me my golden tickets, which are those deep, meaningful conversations, connections, impacts, where people are moved back to the strength and the power within them after they go through that trauma, after they go through that insecurity, that fear. They move through those emotions. They move through those doubts and fears. And then they come back and they step back into the, the magnificence and the sacredness of their own life. And you get to either witness that, to share in that with them, to celebrate that with them. That to me is the most beautiful thing. Um, and I endeavor with, with my work to play, create, um, and come from that place to create that context for that to happen. Because that's the best gift that someone's ever given me. And, and I want to do my part to give that back. But um, jumping over to cancer and insights from, from life. Um, I had a, my doctor experience uh, similar to yours where there was a delay. Um, I, so I talked to my doctor says, yeah, I get to go for ultrasound or something like a, I think it was an ultrasound. Yeah. And I didn't really know what was going, what was going to happen, you know, cause it's on my balls. And I was like, I uh, uh, hope it's not some grumpy old man that just wants to get through this, but I got to do this. Like, all right, this is, I don't want to do this at all, but I got to. So I get to the hospital and I'm, sitting there like waiting in the waiting room and i'm like just like you know just focus man you got to do this get through it and so this beautiful young lady comes in and she's okay come with me i'm like well that's nice at least i get led to the room by a nice young lady so that's fantastic so <laughs> i get to the room she says okay do this you know lay down take your your pants off put this towel over top and um that's what you got to do i was like okay here we go so go and she shuts the door go on my, and so i'm sitting there waiting like, here we go. Like this, you know, I, I'm, I'm preparing for the, for the worst. Like I, I, I'm accepting, you know, if this is what it's going to be, this is what it's going to be. It's got to be this. I got to get this check. And then she comes back in the room and she's going to do the test. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, wait, 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 what's going to happen? And she doesn't even stop to tell me what's going to happen. She just starts getting the stuff ready and starts going. And I just say to her, whoa, 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 whoa. Just before she lifts up the towel, I says, what are you going to do? Like what, what happens? And she's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And she's like, oh, I have this gel. I'm going to put this gel on. I'm going to do this. And so 
anyways, uh, I had a good laugh with my friends about this afterwards. And uh, it was it was a great experience compared to what I thought it was going to be. And uh, then she didn't tell me the results, but I kept trying to probe, like you were saying, like, so does it all look good? Like, are we okay? <laughs> and she's like, uh, oh, you know, your doctor will tell you. And I'm like, ah, all right. Anyways, um, my doctor calls me back later and says I'm fine. But uh, it was it was a fun, I had a good, I had some really good laughs with my friends about this whole experience, having, <laughs> expecting one thing and then getting the exact opposite. Um, but uh, yeah, the perspective that I got from that um, was very much in a similar sort of theme of appreciating life, enjoying life, not taking things so seriously. And it's that, yeah, that rocking chair thing where you return back to that place of acknowledging the fun of life and the joy of living. And sometimes we can get caught up in so much of these, these, at least I do perspectives that are tightening, you know, the things that are going on in the world or got to build these things or what if, what, you know, how, I want to do my best work. And, but to remember that it's like surfing, I, this is the, the sort of, uh, metaphor I use all the time. You got to get out on the wave. You got to do your part. You got to paddle. You got to know how to pop up on the board. You got to be consistently shifting your weight on that and moving. But why are you surfing? You're surfing to have fun. You're surfing to enjoy the process and to who you become in that, in that growth of being that master surfer. And so I, I like to um, combine the, uh, the stories of star Wars and the Jedi's that, that sort of spiritual character with the surfer having fun. So I call it like the Jedi surfer. And that's who I endeavor to be is someone who is deeply connected to the inner journey and the spiritual elements of life, but also just having fun, man. Like not getting, you know, too crazy about um, the beads or the, the, you know, the mantras or any of that stuff that can be very helpful for some people. But at the end of the day, you got to be enjoying your life and having fun and, and uh, playing. So those are my lessons. Yeah. Oscar Wilde said, life is way too important to take so seriously. And that's always yeah. been one of my Amen. favorite quotes. <laughs> and, and talk about a shift in perspective. Sometimes it's just in a moment where you feel the heaviness of it weighing on you. Sometimes it's just to smile or, or to choose to laugh. And that's mm -hmm. why I think, you know, even comedy nowadays is really important. And, and that's why I actually implement comedy into my social media is because I think sometimes we get so tense about all that's going on. And it's like, we kind of just need to laugh. And I try and make fun of myself. I try and make fun of everyone, right? Don't take yourself too seriously as well, too. I got chills when you described the experience where you went down, I think you said by the river with a buddy. Mm -hmm. and just kind of held space for him to scream you know i think you were essentially saying what i'm about to say but just i guess an alternative way because we were kind of answering the question of like well what makes a bond what makes a connection what makes a deep connection with someone and i would actually say you know most people talk about the love the experiences of joy together and i actually think that it's going through and overcoming adversity together. So that to me is what actually bonds me with someone. So I always uh, reiterate this quote that I just love. It's like, you don't truly know someone until you've seen them with tangled Christmas lights, lost luggage and a delayed flight. You don't really <laughs> see someone until you, until you've experienced them. You don't know someone until you've seen them go through adversity. And I think that actually reveals character more than it, it builds it. And I think when you overcome adversity and get through something with someone, like I look at, you know, there's uh, Daryl Lynn Thiessen, we call her D, she's on my team. And she's like, you know, the head honcho. Um, she really, you know, builds this all out. I just, I, I just show up on Instagram and, and these podcasts, but, um, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah, she but sounds anyways, awesome. <laughs> yes, exactly. But she's like, you know, my right-handed woman and, or my right hand woman in, in all of this awakened winning stuff. And she's been with me since day one, since I started mental wealth. 
And if I look at our relationship and how much it's grown and the bond and the connection that we've built that I would say is, is, has gotten to, you know, let's say a deep, deeper level. Um, it is 1000% without a doubt because of the challenges that we've had to overcome together. It's those scrappy, imperfect, teary eyed conversations where we've had elevated nervous systems and stress hormones and we've lost our cool and it's been scrapped and we've had to come together and we've had to hear each other out and we've had to compromise and we've had to work through and overcome those things and when we come out on the other side of those things and i had my best friend me and him went through a very difficult we did some business together and it went south and mm -hmm. we had to go through 10 months of hell and i say hell as in imagine the hardest thing you might have to go through with a friend um it, it was that it was like lawyers and it was like difficult conversation it was tears it was breaking down to each other it was mm -hmm. and i've never felt similar to d coming out on the other side of that i've never not only believed and trusted in those relationships more than I do now, but I've never felt more bonded to them and connected to them. You know, you could say it's just, well, it's solving problems together. Totally. I, 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 so that brought up a question for me. So do you think that there is an element of shared purpose that is revealed and strengthened and that that is a part of this bond when going through, whether it be a marriage, whether it be a business relationship, but because I have found that sometimes going through those really deep conflicts and that you don't come out stronger is the only common denominator I found is that the purpose isn't aligned. There's a disconnect. We have different, there's a disconnect. And then therefore we go separate ways. Look, the only way to, it's, it's like you can't love without the risk of being hurt. You, you know, there's no light without darkness. So the whole reason why I feel so connected to them, I think, is because it could have went south, but it didn't, mm. right? The alternative was this, and there was many times where it felt like, fuck, I don't know if, you know, D's going to work for me for this long. I don't know if me and my buddy are going to be best friends anymore after all this. It could have went that way. The fact that it didn't is, I think, why there's so much gratitude and appreciation for the bonding connection after is because... I mean, look, it's similar to love. Why do we feel so incredible when we are in love? It's because we know the alternative. The alternative mm -hmm. is hurt, abandonment, rejection, judgment, criticism, shame. You know, we've, I, I mentioned those earlier. So yeah, I think you're totally right. It's, it's, it's actually getting to a place where you end up realizing we are so connected in terms of our intention, our values, where we want this relationship to go, that we're willing to go through what we just went through and still compromise and come together and make this work. And it doesn't always go that way. No. You know? Yeah, and that's what I've, that's what I've witnessed in, in my life uh, in many different areas, but uh, it has taught me the importance of purpose and sharing that vision and why we're doing this, what we're, where we're going, why this, why I'm connected to this, why I'm inspired by this. And that when you have that shared vision um, for your marriage, for your business, for whatever <clears throat> it is, it makes it so much more easier to move through that difficult conversation, you know, whatever, because it's worth it. And then, like you said, um, the value of moving through that and going through those really scary times, like potentially I'm going to lose this friend or this partner or this business or whatever. Um, but I have to stay aligned with this vision or this mission or what I feel in my heart is what I need to say or do. Uh, and then when you come out the other side, like, Oh wow, they also valued this. They also moved through this and we're together on this. Which actually, sorry to interject, but which actually is probably what you're describing as transcending ego. So it, it actually might be that you're putting mm. your egos to the side and you're actually prioritizing the higher mission. So for me and D, yeah. the higher mission is our community. What we're doing, we have a huge opportunity. We, we are very mission bought in 
And that's what we were, we were able to put our egos to the side, get through those difficult times for the mission. Same thing with my buddy, right? The higher mission there is the bond and connection that we already had, you know, like, like let's stop having our egos get in the way because that's really the only thing that could get in the way of us not getting through this because mm. at the end of the day we are both intending to just we're just going out and doing our thing man like we have our own yeah. struggles and one of us fucked up um and that was the difficult part but you know he didn't mean to mess up and i had to put my ego to the side and and recognize that and say he didn't mean to or intend to do this. It's just something outside of his control went south and that sucks, yeah. but let's come yeah. together. And so I think it is transcending ego to a certain I, I agree with you. Once you said that, I was like, I think you're totally right. And it's putting that mission first or the, the impact that you want to have, the, the ins inspiring sort of journey that you're on and reconnecting to that. There's a great, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the lady who uh, shared this. I saw it on a Tony Robbins thing and it's called this conflict uh, resolution method. It's called SEW and it's sensations, emotions, and, and wants, I think it is. And dealing with people, uh, a lot of the times it's like, well, it's your fault. I want, you know, you're, you're making me feel this way. You did this, you messed up. And instead removing that and making the whole conversation non-argumentative, non you can't argue it. So it's the sensations I'm feeling in my body and forgive me, I'm speaking out of school, but you can Google this SEW method, uh, and hopefully you can find the, the doctor or the, the woman that, that came up with this. And the way I remember it is sensations, emotions, and wants. So you say, I'm feeling tight in my chest. I'm feeling, uh, you know, tension in my neck, um, heavy. And then the emotions I'm feeling are sad, scared, uh, whatever. And then the, what I want is to build this business. What I want is to reconnect with you. And there's nothing you can argue about that. You can't say, well, I didn't mean to make you feel this way. It's just, that's what they're feeling. That's it. That's what they're going through. And this is what they want, what they want to move towards, as opposed to, oh, I don't want this. I don't want that. Well, what do you want then? Move towards what you want. And you can't argue that. And I think that kind of plays into this conversation too, of moving past the ego, but also acknowledging what's going on within your body. So you're not suppressing what's happening. So you're allowing it to move through you. And as, a, as somebody on the other end of this, but then you swap spaces, but you listen to that person. You listen to what they're going through. You acknowledge it because that's their experience. These are the sensations they're having. This is the emotions they have, and this is what they want. Great. Now I'm going to express that as well. And I, I thought, what a great, what a fascinating and great way to get past the ego and the blame game and just get back to our mission. What do we want? So uh, I, hopefully people I can Google that. that and find that. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love that. And look, you know what? Conflict conflict resolution strategies are incredibly powerful because you know it's interesting and and they talk about this in Adlerian psychology and philosophy where they talk about the root of every problem in your life is interpersonal relationships so like if you really think about it every problem and I'm sure someone could challenge this but let's just say I'm not maybe I won't speak definitively but like most of your problems at the very least all root to some sort of interpersonal relationship at the end of the day right even if you think it's no this is my problem it's like well but like let's you know really dig deep and eventually it gets to a person right mm. um now and and again maybe it's just most of of our problems so when it comes to um you know the conflict resolution often with the things we desire in our lives, the thing that's in the way is usually a person, usually a conversation that you have to have, right? Often one that we're afraid to have because there's vulnerability in that, right? So conflict res resolutions, look, if you can learn to have difficult conversations, I would even go as far as, and I don't think I'm the originator of this quote, but I would even go as far as saying, your success in any relationship or you could even maybe go as far as saying in your life is proportionate to the amount of difficult conversations you're willing to have mm -hmm. because even so for me i said after my cancer scare that inevitably like unwaveringly sure that the thing i need to put more attention to is bonds and connections and really i'm going to have to have difficult conversations if i want to 
you know, um, cultivate those bonds and those deeper totally. connections. So um, one conflict resolution on the topic of that, that I like is to, is to practice because how things uh, are taken is not always how things are intended. So I love to practice, you know, it, let's say me and you, Graham, let's say we did some, a project together, a strategic partnership on something. And then we had to have a difficult conversation because we don't see eye to eye on something. Well, what a beautiful opportunity for growth and to deepen our connection. That's the way I would look at it right away, even though it wouldn't feel good. It wouldn't be convenient. But if you said something that didn't really rub me the wrong way or maybe triggered me a little bit, Number one, I know that that's my own stuff, right? That's my heart rate is getting elevated because I, for some reason, don't feel safe because it's triggering a wound that I have from my past experiences and, and environment. So I know that that's mine to deal with, but how I would respond to that would not be, well, but Graham, like this, that, and the other thing and get super defensive. What I would say is I would say, hey, Graham, when you say this, the story that I tell myself in my head or the thought process mm -hmm. that comes up for me or my perspective or the way it makes me feel is X. Now, I don't know if that's how you intended. I just wanted to let you know how I feel. Tell me if that's accurate or what your thought process was. And, and that's like that. just a small shift in instead of like right away, essentially taking it personally, you're just acknowledging that like similar to the SEW, it's like, this is what came up for me when mm -hmm. I heard X, right? And it's, yeah, the, the awareness part too, right? Because if you don't have the awareness to go, oh, whoa, look what's happening within me right now. And you don't have that, just that little bit of space, then you're in it. It's like you, when you get lost in the movie and you're, you're crying or you're scared, but it's all just happening on the screen. You forgot that you're watching a movie. And well, I think you, that's Have you exactly read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? One of my favorite so, books. So you know the, his quote, it's exactly what you're saying. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space lies your ability to respond. In that response lies your growth and your freedom. I just, I had to say it because it's like the quote I, for what you're saying. The fantastic. I love that book. I don't remember that part, but that's, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. And that's, that's exactly it. And I think that cultivating that ability to create that, just that space before the, the response of the stimulus is so powerful. Um. I, I love that and I endeavor to practice that as often as I can because I've realized how often my response is just unconscious automatic. And then I can now, I've now developed sort of like a, you know, when you, when someone's staring at you at the corner of your eye and you can kind of feel it. So I get that kind of sense when I'm going down a, a response mechanism that is not coming from that place of awareness where I'm like, whoa, I'm getting really involved in this. What's going on, Graham? <laughs> why are you getting so heated why are you getting so triggered by this person what's going on normally i have to go for a walk or or a nice hot shower and that gives me that clarity i could just be curious playfully curious as to what's going on in that space before the response of like oh look what's happening here man i've avoided or dodged bullets as i like to call it like from the matrix so many times just by giving myself that little bit of space before responding and recognizing, oh, this is what's going on right now. Oh, this is an insecurity from here that I got to deal with. Okay, I've dealt with that. Okay, I can acknowledge that in myself. Okay, I need to, you know, shape up or, or change this behavior. And now I respond. And then there's no continuation and, you know, expansion of the, of the issue <laughs> or the conflict. Um, yeah, uh, that's uh, Man, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl is one of my favorite books. Uh, Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer, another amazing. Have you read Michael Singer's uh, Surrender Experiment? Oh, yeah, it's it's in our training to recommend to our clients to read. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. banger. Yeah, I love that one, man. So good. Yeah. So good. Yeah, surrendering to the things that you cannot control, right? And And talk about, you know, being awake. I mean, look, a lot of these external and conditional things that we worry about, um, we don't have any control over. So Peter Crone, I had Peter Crone on, on my show uh, a few months ago, and he's incredible. And one of the things he said in the interview, we, I think we actually called the, the title of the episode was this, but he said, there's no external boogeyman. You know, there's no external boogie, boogeyman. We all think that our problems are out there. We think it's Justin Trudeau. We think it's the WEF. We think that it's 
yeah, it's okay to recognize those things and to speak up and to fight against those things and to say no. I would say that's really the extent is just say no. But like sometimes that means we got to hit the streets. But do not forget the things that you, there needs to be a certain level of surrender to those things because if you don't have enough surrender to Justin Trudeau, like people say, how can you live in Canada right now? It's because I have tolerance for the bullshit. And what's tolerance to the bullshit? It's surrendering to things that I just don't control. And I'm not under the delusion that like I can't be happy in Canada because Justin Trudeau is in power, you know? And then I Mm. focus the majority of the time on the things that I can control, which have to do with me. I can Mm -hmm. go out, I can build those bonds and connections. I can work on surrender. I can meditate. I can work out. I can stay healthy. I can create financial freedom. I can, you know, build my business. The list goes on. And this, this, I like that. Uh, And this, in my mind, kind of goes back to, you know, the the wef or or justin trudeau or whoever may be is the sort of the end result of all the collective it's sort of like this the sickness in society it's got to that point where now at the top is this and if we if we if we don't change the base level whether it be our health you know metaphorical or or the diet we have the, the mental state that we're in then we can't sustain someone that is in that position that is at that place as well so if we just swap out the guy at the top or the person at the top put someone else in but we haven't changed the base layer we're just buying the new set of gym clothes but we're not going to the gym but it re- works in reverse too so if we if everyone and i know this is a pipe dream but if everyone took re- personal responsibility and everyone just prioritized their health wealth you know like relationships then that will change who's in power i think that that's what i'm saying power well, ha- yeah, it has it, to. Yeah, I think it who's in to. power is a reflection of the collective consciousness. Yes, that, that, that's that's what I was tr- trying to say is that it, it it has to work that way. And if you put someone in power, that the people at the base level aren't at that level of awareness yet, or or to support that, to stand up, to defend that, they won't last. It won't work. So you can't have a savior like that. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's a, a ground up sort of thing. And it has to be that way because that's the only way it's sustainable. Um, yeah. What is your thoughts on the future? Um, where do you think we're headed? You know, you could talk globally. You could talk about Canada. I mean, we have quite a few American listeners as well too. So definitely include and give some love to, to America. But, um, and I love the States. I, I, I go there a lot. Um, Yeah. Like, where do you think we're headed? How are you speaking of perspective? What is your perspective on everything that's happening? And how are you, I guess, approaching that and preparing for what's to come? You know, over the past couple of years, I've heard a lot of people, a lot of perspectives, videos I've watched, people I've spoken to about what's going to happen. I remember hearing theories about uh early when the vaccine started rolling out that there were going to be bodies lined up on the side of the road and we would be have to be moving dead bodies you know it'd be just just massacre of people and i was like whoa that's crazy you know and i was like is this what was this my life's going to be like i'm going to be you know pulling bodies for the next you know however many years like trying to just clean up the streets um I've heard countless times the economy is going to collapse and everything's going to go. We're going to, you know, it's all horrible. Um, So many things. And, um, and then they don't happen or they don't happen to that extent or they don't happen the way it was said, or it's not as bad as that, you know, or it's not at all. Um, So I've, I've really learned from that in terms of like what's grabbing my attention and what's the, what's the value in predicting or thinking about the future. Um, and I don't, now I kind of subscribe to this idea where I, I moved down the path of just listening to my intuition and it's almost like, um, you're watching two semi trucks kind of coming towards each other. Like most likely they're going to hit and I can kind of get a sense of how it's going to interact and, and crash, but I don't know, there could be an adjustment and things could move the other way and they could not happen. 
I, I always think it's like nobody knows. So anybody who says what's going to happen, you know, obviously it's like they don't know. Um, but I do think that there are similar to if you see two people in a relationship and they're fighting and they're in their egos, you can kind of get a sense of where this is going to end up unless they make a shift and they shift back to that purpose or to their intentions to getting a, a separate from those things. So I think in the world, we're kind of going through this, this massive conflict. And a lot of people think it's going to end really badly or it's going to get really, really bad. Um, and I think it could get bad. I think it could get really uncomfortable for a lot of people. The way I see it is it will get as uncomfortable as it needs to for people to learn the lesson. So, uh, and that's needed. It has to happen that way. You have to go through it. Now, like I was saying earlier, some people have to face death. Some people have to lose all their, their money in their home and their business. Some people have to lose uh, friends and family. Some people just need to hear the story to acknowledge the lesson and go, my life is sacred. I'm going to live for today. And like you said, focus on what I can control and come from a place of integrity. Um, and I think that by, by acknowledging the sacredness of the lesson that's in front of you, you can circumvent and dodge bullets of so much that you don't, you don't need to go through. If you can take that lesson seriously, if you can take that rocking chair method and go, at the end of my life, is this really going to be that important? Is this the path that I would really feel good about taking and know I can sleep at night? So um, I don't believe to in, in you know being naive about not preparing. You know, I like the ideas of growing your own food. And, and my litmus test is always, if nothing happened that was super catastrophic in the future, would I still enjoy growing my own food? 100%. So do it. Uh, if nothing happened in the future, would I still need like a hazmat suit and all this guns and ammo and, you know, explosives on the doors of someone was, to... no, I wouldn't. So I probably don't need to do that. <laughs> you know, uh, I still have my firearms license and I, I, I love that. I think self-defense is great. Um, I don't think, pe um, people uh, outsourcing their, their defense to someone else or to just trusting that they'll be okay. I think it's, it's a healthy thing to be able to protect yourself. Um, but I think violence is the absolute last thing to go to. It's, it's only to protect your own body and your own, your family and your, your friends. Um, so in that sense, that's how I sort of approach what's going on in the future is I look at in my life, what is the lesson right here in front of me? There's a lot of politics, a lot of crazy stuff going on. Um, and that's good to be aware of. But my main focus is what's the lesson that's in front of me and how can I honor this, which is with as much sacredness so that I appreciate and digest and integrate this. That is going to be my best defense at whatever goes on in the exterior world because I become stronger and I'm learning the spiritual lesson because this to me is all just an opportunity for our soul, our spirit to grow and to learn. And once we die, we go, oh, wow, what a crazy experience that was. Wow, what are all these things I learned. And so to not get caught in the noise, uh, to be aware of, okay, there are certain steps I need to take, maybe become more self-sovereign, maybe take control more of my finances. I'm a big Bitcoin guy. I love learning about <clears throat> the self-sovereignty of um, Bitcoin specifically and, and how you hold your private keys and these types of things. I was like, even if the financial system doesn't collapse, I love the idea that I control my money, that nobody else can tell me what I can spend or not spend. I think that's fantastic. And that's a great technology. So I'm going to invest uh, time and energy and resources to learn about that. Um, so I see the same with food. I see the same with relationships and housing and how I build my life. Um, and I think in terms of the future, nobody knows. And it doesn't really matter because we can only, you know, affect what's right in front of us and, and the most impact and, and uh, meaningful progress we can make is with the lesson right now in front of us. That's how I see. It. Yeah, I, I love all of that, particularly the way you started when you said, you know, and I've talked about this a lot, but I, I just don't know that I can, or we can talk about it too much at this point. You talked about how you were hearing that, oh, like, as soon as everyone gets vaccinated, everyone's going to die. Um, 
as soon as uh you know fall comes there's going to be food shortages and the mass mandates are coming back like it's just it's it's always something <laughs> different you know the the elites are all going to get arrested and they're all they're all like they're planning a big and it's like maybe maybe i think i think what really bothers <laughs> me yeah i think what really bothers me is most of those things never have come true um now there are certain things us as the awake crowd especially during COVID, like hey vitamin d works uh turns out it actually does um you know or hey masks don't actually really work turns out they actually don't lockdowns do more harm than good turns out that we have the data to say that that's even true as well too hey the vaccine's not going to work hey it doesn't stop transmission hey like i could go on ivermectin like yeah we could go on we were right about a lot of things over COVID. um but the extreme stuff like it, it almost felt like as soon as we got out of COVID, people wanted to hang on to like there's more bullshit coming and it's like how do we know like you don't know do not succumb to the same kind of fear mongering that the other side does i hate to make this sound tribal but that the other side does i really see in the awake community people love to do that as well too we are very prone and vulnerable to negativity and fear because i think for a couple of reasons we have a negativity bias um because those have always been threats so we put more weight into that but i think most importantly our stress hormones arouse us so like i think that so many people live in environments and, and grow up in experiences where they get conditioned to adapt to chaotic environments where stress hormones are high and then as soon as they get into their adult life if nothing crazy is going on, it's boring. And then, and then their nervous system is like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta jack up those hormones. And, and, and it actually makes you feel unsafe. So I think people just love to be like, Oh fuck, like this is happening. Like Kaylor, you gotta do this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, I totally agree with you, Graham. And that, look, I want to have a stocked freezer. You know, I want to have a generator just even because if the power goes out, like there was a yeah. in Kelowna, I was in Kelowna and the power went out from, it was a scheduled maintenance that I didn't know about. And from 10 PM to 4 AM, the power went out and like, I couldn't see anything in my fucking place. It would have just been nice to have a generator. Right. You know, I, I, I want to have one of those straws. I don't have this yet that you can drink from anywhere. It just oh, it yeah, makes yeah, me yeah, sit yeah, better yeah. at, at yeah. night, you know, like and it's like, fun. It's cool. <laughs> exactly. And actually in our awaken winning Academy, which we call the life Academy, Meg Garland, who is a prepared living coach. She does uh, an entire training. She does calls. We have basically a one-on-one on, on how to get prepared. And I put that in our program because I wanted to solve that problem for me. And I figured probably our clients want that as well too. So, um, yeah, I want to be prepared, but yeah. I also don't want to live in a victim mentality of like, they have control over my life. It's like, you know, an asteroid could come, you know, in, in 47 days, we could, you know, NASA could announce that a, an asteroid is coming or for those who don't believe in NASA, you know, whatever <laughs> it, it actually is coming in. But yeah, I just don't get caught up in too much of the bullshit. Yeah. You know, whatever, everything could end tomorrow. But I think that at the end of the day, be prepared to a certain extent, but don't live in that fear, be prepared so you can actually move on and you don't have to yeah. think about it. And the other thing, and I'll give a shout out to Corey George. I don't know if you ever have heard him speak, but oh, he yeah. does an excellent job on really communicating how much we should actually be appreciative of how the establishment works like there has been almost food shortages and he talks about how the big corporations like maple leaf and all these other big food companies that we always demonize and say they only fucking care about this that and the other thing they got together and they were like how do we solve this let's get some you know more you know uh product from from this range of the states and this that and they figured it out and guess what we still had eggs and chicken breasts mm. and stuff like that. So it's like, we also need to give credit or Elon Musk, everyone shits on him. And it's like, do we, can we also acknowledge what he's doing for free speech right now? Well, Kaylor, he's yeah. paid opposition and he's got a hidden agenda. That <laughs> you're, you're being naive. You're being so naive. You don't even see it. It's like, maybe, but maybe not. Stop speaking in definitive absolutes because you don't actually know at the end of the day. Yep. And, and, and if you don't like, 
uh, X or Twitter, then don't use it and then yeah. relax, you know, like, um, and if, and if he is doing things that are, you know, compromising people's integrity or, or censoring stuff. Yeah. Speak out about that. It doesn't have to be black or white. Like my, when I was a kid, it was always black or white. My mom was like, Graham, there is a gray zone. Like you got to understand the gray. You have to understand that. Um, and the, the other thing I was going to say was we were talking about, uh, people in the, quote unquote, awake community that, uh, you know, getting sucked into the fear and everything. There's always a, it's like, I think it's black pill. Is that what the refer when, when it's a black pilled person? It's always like the truth is always like terrible. Yeah. I think that's what it what means. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the black pill. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I've always, I've looked at that. I've gone like, like you said, it's like they become habituated to that stress response or to that. Everything is a lie response. And uh, I learned a lot from Dr. Joe Dispenza and his, his teachings and his books. And that was something that really stuck with me was the understanding of we get the sense of who we are by this sort of chemical reaction in our body. And if we're habituated to feeling stress every morning at 7 a.m. because we're stuck in traffic on Saturday when we're not working, we find something to be stressed about because it makes us feel like ourselves because we think that's who we are because we keep feeling that so often. So if we felt like everything's against us and everyone's out there and everything's a psyop or controlled opposition, there's a gen there's an response, there's an emotional response in the body and there's chemicals released. And then we become habituated to, this is what gives me power. This is who I am. This is my defense mechanism. And if I'm not feeling that, then who am I? And so I have to find something to validate that everything's a lie or everything's controlled opposition. And I thought that was super powerful. Um, to understand how the brain and body work. And as an actor, uh, that really helped me understand because I played a character for 14 years on a television show. So I was generating emotions and thoughts and beliefs and an identity around a character that wasn't real. But because I, I played that character and I was in that state more than I was in my own state and investing in my own state and investing in my own growth, that one, it became very confusing and conflicting, very, very mentally challenging. And to break free from that, I had to understand it first and understand what was going on in my body. I had built neural pathways in my brain and emotional sort of familiarity with, with uh, the relationships of the character that were stronger than my own. And so it was very confusing. But understanding that was like, oh, wow, like this is what can happen, not just as an actor, but in life. This is what people do. They get stuck in roles, stuck in identities. And we don't know we're stuck in them, but because we've habituated ourselves to the emotions that come from, whether it be the stress response or everyone's up to, you know, it's all the psyop, um, we forget uh, that the power we have is to continually be into this moment. And before that stimulus and response, have that space to go, what's actually going on? What am I actually feeling right now? What am I, why am I <laughs> continually looking for this? And I, I think that that is the, one of the most powerful techniques uh, to generate in, in my life um, and what I've seen for other people too is, is the pause in the silence because I believe all the answers are in the silence waiting for us to tune in. Man, we could talk for hours about what you just said there, um, particularly about your character that you played and the neural pathways that were built because of that. I, I almost, so one thing that comes up for me when you talked about the awake community and always needing something, you know, to point the finger, it's victim mentality. It's the fetist mindset. It's being able to point your finger and saying everything and everyone outside of me is the problem. And that validates your shortcomings. And it, and it actually also rids you of the responsibility that you'd have to take if you actually went out and fucking did what you want in this world, right? It mm. rids you of that responsibility. So you can just sit there and say, well, this is the reason why, you know, it's justifying with logic, why you're not going out and, and getting the life that you actually desire. But our nervous system, and this is very much getting into Joe Dispenza work, but our, our nervous system and our psychology will actually in our subconscious mind will actually optimize for an familiar hell over a unfamiliar heaven yes <laughs> right so like but I, but can i ask you this this is a deep question do you think that that character that you played for i think you said 12 years uh, 14 years 14 do you think that it was that you stepped into that and created 
neural pathways. I'm really into somatic work as well too, or I'm getting really into somatic work and somatic work is of the belief that we have different parts of us. Okay. Do you think it was as much as you adapted to that? Or do you think that it actually just more so exposed a part that was already within you and it brought that part out of you instead of maybe looking at it in the way in which I think you described it, which was you adapted to it. It just might have been exposing something that was already there, a part of you that maybe in some sense wasn't a part that you were particularly proud of or maybe ashamed of. And that was maybe where it was difficult. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Just a thought experiment. I, yeah, I I'm not totally sure. How, I, wrong. I, yeah. Um, I mean, ob there was obvious elements of the character that I played <clears throat> that uh, resonated with me. There was obvious things that were not a part of my life or I had no experience with or was you know, foreign to me. So I had to generate that as best I could to make it real. Um, there, there was a lot of... Uh, I guess you could call it like harmony or synchronicity within the internal struggles that I was going through that rhymed with the internal struggles of the character. So yes, mm -hmm. there were parts of me that were um, similar to in, in an energetic sense within the character. Um, and that the, the process of telling those stories also had an impact on my own life. However, <laughs> I remember many times coming home from set after shooting a big scene that was deeply resonating with an internal uh, battle or struggle or learning that I was going through, but not having the time to process it, go through it, learn from it and, and take the time on my own life. Cause I had to study another eight pages of scripts or, you know, the, the scenes for tomorrow and get ready for the next one. So that would just get put in a box and pushed away. Um, does that answer the question? I think, I think, yeah, that's... no, no, uh, for sure. It, it's just, was an interesting and i i wasn't even suggesting that i i necessarily thought that's what was happening i just was hmm. interested to know whether or not it was you know was it more so revealing an already existing part of you or exemplifying or or maybe shining a light on or expanding this part of you that already existed as opposed to maybe more so creating a part of you that hadn't existed before and you stepped into that. I, I just would love to know. It's probably oh, a combination oh. of both. It's a, yeah, no, it's a combination of both. Uh, and and um, like I mentioned at the beginning there, be, having gone through some sexual abuse, there was there has been a, um, a challenge for me to try and escape that and, and almost like it never happened. And so playing a character on a television show was almost like a way of like, that's not... It's, I've, I've achieved that. I've been escaped that. And this identity is free from that trauma. And I don't have to deal with that. So if I invest a lot in acting, whatever role it was, that will get me away from this. And by playing a character for 14 years, you know, that was, I think, at a sort of deeper level, an escape mechanism. But it wasn't based in reality. And that's what I was saying is that that conflict um, it became uh, debilitating uh, because uh it was revealed to me through you know growing up and going through my own things and maturing that this needed to be dealt with it was important and the without going too far into this um my approach had been to go so far and so deep into the to becoming this character as best i could because the more i did the better chances of success the better chances of the show continuing my career expanding um but the fuel that was was charging that was one of escapism from the things and the demons and the things that I hadn't dealt with in the past. And so now that was my process of now, okay, now I have to go back and deal with all these things that I had been running from because no amount of fame or success or career expansion will ever fill a void inside of insecurity, doubts, and, and a lack of self-love. Um, but when you spend so much of your time and attention on creating a character. I remember Kaylor when I first, I think it was at my website. I like redid my website or something. And I finally started speaking my own voice and I put up some quotes or I did something. I can't remember exactly what it was. And it was so uh, psychologically disorienting to me because I had stepped into this character to such a degree that by putting out into the public 
my own views or my own sort of unique perspective, it was, it was jarring. And I remember showing up to work the next day <laughs> and I was sitting in a truck. We were doing a scene where my character had to say goodbye to his, his wife or his girlfriend at the time. I can't remember. And the father-in-law or the, the dad was beside me. And it was just a simple thing. Me just waving out the window and saying goodbye. I was so disoriented because of this conflict in my brain about identity and what was going on that I turned to him and I said, I don't know if I can act anymore. I don't know. I don't know how to, what I'm doing. I was having like this sort of like breakdown. And he looked at me like, like, are you joking? Are you pulling my leg right now? Like, dude, you just turn out the window, and you wave and you say a line. But for me, it was such a psychological challenge of what I was going through because of how much energy and attention I had put into running from my trauma in my past. And that to finally go back to it and say, I'm not going to abandon this innocence within myself, that young child that is still hurting, that needs my love, that needs my support. I'm not going to abandon him. I'm going to give him a voice. I'm going to protect him. That was so unusual for my brain. It was like all the wires were being unplugged. And <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to act anymore. Um, so anyways, it was a funny story for me. Um, but I think uh, it's important to recognize that when, when going through the shifts uh, of identity, it can be very disorienting. It can be very confusing, as I'm sure you probably know as well. And uh, as an actor, you know, that's the world you live in is shifting identities and shifting emotions and to the, to the highest extent that you could possibly muster. So um, it's been a beautiful gift to teach me about the inner workings of, of myself and of, of human beings in general, uh, the emotions and the thoughts and the beliefs and how they shape our life. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to see you go through something like that in your life. And, you know, it's incredibly nuanced. The, the, the healing and growth journey from something like that, and I have my own story of things that I went through, um, we all do, um, mm -hmm. that we need to heal from. But the journey of healing is incredibly nuanced. You know, it's like, it's incredibly complicated. There's, there's numerous factors, but if I could simplify it to it's, it's the unconscious versus the conscious. So most people deal with it. And I did for many years and that's why I abused substances. And I was, I was in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And what I was just doing was I was disconnecting from self constantly. It was like, what, what can I do to disconnect from self? And it was, if it wasn't the booze, it was the weed. If it wasn't the weed, it was the porn. If it wasn't the porn, it was the, the relationship. If it wasn't, it was sabotaging the relationship. If it wasn't that it was, you know, food and the list goes on. And it was just like, what, what will bring me further away from self? Because I was afraid to go internal mm -hmm. and look at all of those things. And it, it reminded me of when you were talking about like the way to heal. And again, this is an oversimplification, but in summary, the way to heal from a past experience that left an imprint and a wound on you is to actually, you know, create space for and connect back to that younger self, whereas most people are unconsciously running away and, and just doing everything and anything. And it's, it's difficult. It ain't easy. Yes. Right. And, yeah. and it's not supposed to be, you're actually building your capacity to be with the wound. That's how we heal. The wound is stepping into it. The only way to heal a wound is to face it. Right. So you got to step yeah. into that. Um, and that's kind of part of, I believe, you know, what you're saying in your story and it's just beautiful. And I'm so glad that you've come to the realization that that's how, you know, you ultimately have to heal from it. And, and I don't know where you're at on that journey, but I'm sure you've made, uh, if not a lot of progress, um, you know, some progress and, uh, man, it, it's really cool, uh, to have the first conversation we've really had and to see how conscious of an individual you are, how deep of a thinker you are and how much you have to offer in, in terms of wisdom. So, um, this has been Thanks, an absolute pleasure and I, I live for these kind of conversations. Uh, I really do. Same here, man. Same here. So any, uh, last words do you have? What, what's, what's your, uh, initiatives going forward? What's, what's the mission? And then certainly if you have anything you want people to go visit promo, sure. anything. Uh, yeah. So, so my thing is, uh, like we were saying just before, I think we started recording here is, is, uh, having fun with life. Um, and, uh, obviously I've been in the film world 
so I like uh, I like creating stuff, making movies, still do a bit of acting. Um, I have a podcast, Time Has Come. I have an online community uh, around the podcast called Time Has Come. Well, Time Has Come dot com. I have my new book of poetry here, which is also called Time Has Come, <laughs> which the idea is just being present with what's going on in your life. What is the time coming for in your life? And to honor that process one step at a time, get outside into the unknown and explore life. And uh, on your terms, not because Graham said it or Kayla said it or, or you know, so someone so you, you look up to, uh, they're doing this. It's like just getting present and quiet with yourself, developing that relationship and then taking that leap of faith, whatever it means to you. Um, that's really my mission. And, and like I, I said earlier, my golden ticket is to facilitate as best I can create experiences, whether it be movies or podcasts, uh, poetry videos, poetry books, um, to give people the invitation uh, to come along on the journey of going inward and developing a relationship with however you see a higher power, whether it be God or the Holy Spirit or the universe, or just a sense of love and, and gratitude developing that relationship, moving into that. Um, that's my main focus. And that's what, uh, like I said before, I've been given that gift of moving deeper into that connection. And it has saved me. It has brought me so much joy and inspiration and love for life. And so however somebody's path up the mountain, it takes them there. I want to do my best to support and encourage them and celebrate with them along their journey, however unique and different it might be. So that's my mission. Those are my things. Uh, I'm on Instagram X as well. And time has come.com Graham Wardle online.com. And my podcast is called time has come. Thanks. Go Taylor. Check it. Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> Go check it out, brother. This has been so good. And uh, yeah, the work you're doing is really important. It's, it's just really important. I, I want to acknowledge to also have a man in this space in this awake Canadian uh, community, um, because I, I think we, we desperately need more men who are composed, rational, reasonable, but also deep thinkers, conscious thinkers, open hearted thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, we need we need more of that. And, and you're you're that person in this community. You're one of those uh, men, one of them. And, yeah. And yeah, it's um, it's it's very much needed. So thank you for for what you're doing, brother. Thank you for what you're doing too, Kaylor, man. I appreciate you inviting me on. And this has been a fantastic conversation. Maybe we'll go surfing one day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have some fun. I'll lay on the beach while you go surfing. <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll get out there. I'll get out there. That's awesome. Uh, awesome.